God, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We just praise your name. Hallelujah. You are a great and a mighty God. There's none like you, Lord. You alone are worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship, Lord. We celebrate you this morning, Lord. We bless your name. And thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. For all of your benefits. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. The Lord. Give him a hand clap. Praise God. Thank the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Tim, for opening. Thank you, Roberto and worship team. God bless all of you. Amen. Thank the Lord. God is good. Thank you, Jesus. I'm just, I'll just start off by saying, uh, uh, without going too far, but uh, things that have been happening here over the last, uh, you know, several months, I guess, it's easy to get distracted. <clears throat> We're all human. But I'll t I can tell you this much. This is not my first rodeo, praise the Lord. It's not the first time I've been disappointed. It's not the first time I've been hurt. It's not the first time I've been challenged. But I can tell you this, I've never backed down from one, and I'm not about to start now. Doesn't mean I don't get irritated and aggravated and frustrated like everybody else does, but I'll tell you, you find out who you really are when push comes to shove. And that goes for all of us. That goes for us as a church, and that goes for us as individuals. Amen. So it's easy to be, you know, brave and strong and all that when everything's, the wind's at your back. Amen. But I'm telling you, the devil would like nothing more than to get us into fear or anxiety or stress. This thing wasn't built on one person or ten people or a hundred people. It was built on Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nothing has changed as far as God's concerned. And so in my mind, nothing has changed for me. <coughs> What God's asking me to do is the same thing He's been asking me to do for the last 35 years. I haven't changed, and He hasn't changed. Praise the Lord. That doesn't mean I don't deviate, you know, sometimes like all of us do. It's frustrating. It's aggravating. But I'm telling you, the more the enemy comes against me, the angrier I get, and the more I want to fight back. So I'm, I'm not intimidated by this. If we've got what kind of worship we have, it'll be what it is. And we'll find out, are we worshiping the Lord or are we worshiping a worship team or some individual? Amen. Amen. I appreciate all that they do. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm very grateful for it. But if we let that determine our spirituality and whether or not we're able to be led by the Lord or move in the direction God wants us to move, then we're unworthy servants anyway. I mean, we're really, we, you can't expect, listen, people have been having church without music. I mean, you go back to the old brush arbor days and they might have had a wash tub and a juice harp or something, but they still worship the Lord, and they had some tremendous moves of God, amen, without that. I believe God's going to bring people that are gifted and talented and that want to share those talents with us. But in the meantime, we're going to have to have church, amen, however we can have church. And that, that's up to us just trusting the Lord and doing, amen, uh, what God wants us to do. So don't think because, you know, things get a little hairy from time to time, and look, this is the nature of the beast. Amen? You want to do something for God, there's going to be resistance. If you want to walk the path that Jesus has put us on, there's going to be a struggle. There's going to be some fighting. There's going to be some warfare. Praise the Lord. If, if that scares you, we're in the wrong place. Praise the Lord. We ought to be down at Joe's bar right now <clears throat> having shooters. Amen? Because then we wouldn't be, you know, what? we wouldn't be stressing until tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. So it's all good. Amen. It's not perfect, but it's good. And God knows how to keep us on the path we need to. That's for whosoever will. Okay. Praise the Lord. So don't, you know, don't think because it's, it's frustrating and aggravating that I'm throwing in the towel. It's just that it, it, it becomes almost uh, counterproductive to have a service on Wednesday night with two people. Okay, so I'm not giving in to anything. I'm just saying that doesn't make sense economically. It doesn't make sense in any way. So I'm not going to be stupid about it and just be stubborn. The church is going to go on. The church is going to thrive, and it's going to be what God intended it to be. And for whosoever will, whoever wants to be a part of it, praise the Lord.
So we haven't backed down in that way at all. I don't want you to think that this is some kind of caving in and giving up or anything like that. It's not happening. Praise the Lord. So you can tell a lot about people by their blood type. <laughs> Amen. Be positive or be negative. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. We, we're, we're not, you know, we're in for the long haul. Praise the Lord. That's what it all amounts to. So, with that in mind, lighten up. Praise God. You know, my dog died. I'm going to lighten up. I'm going to tell you about my dead dog now. Uh, my dog died last year in March. And uh, it was weird. His name was Nelson, and I didn't name him. That was the name he already had when we got him. I probably would have named him something else, like Bob or something. But anyway, that was his name. He called him Brother Nelson, yes. But uh, one day the sheriff, <clears throat> you know, we live out in, kind of out in the country, like, and the sheriff came and said, told me that uh, Nelson was chasing a man on a bicycle. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. He doesn't even have a bicycle. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Nelson. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, amen. I got a, a bunch of things I want to talk to you about this morning. It may, you know, it's kind of complex and, and even maybe even more convoluted than it is complex, but uh, we're talking to you about being in Christ. And so I, I want to start this by, I just want to read Revelation chapter 10. That's 11 verses, so we'll just read the, the whole thing. Revelation chapter 10. So I want to talk to you about what God is doing in us and what God is doing for us. It's, this is all about the mystery, amen, of Christ in you. Praise God. The hope of glory. So in, in Revelation chapter 10, he says, I... And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot on the earth, cried with a loud voice as when a lion roareth, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. When the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be no time or should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again, and said, Go, and take the little book which is opened in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel, and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it, and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many people and nations and tongues and kings. If go back to verse 7 if you can, Roberto. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. Praise the Lord. Work very close to this, I believe, right now. Amen. And it's this, what is finished, amen, is that mystery. And that mystery is that Christ is in us. That's the mystery of old, amen, that the prophets tried to prophesy about without even understanding truly what they were prophesying, amen. And it's what the church is still trying to uh, manifest and, and become reality to each one of us. That's the challenge. That's where we're at. And I think that's what God, amen, is trying to get us to understand. There's this bitterness, amen, and I, that's kind of what I want to talk. I was thinking, uh, we were watching the, the service last Sunday, and uh, I know Jane had mentioned about someone with unforgiveness or couldn't get past something, and it creates bitterness, amen, and th that's not unique. I mean, we all know have had situations and, and uh, issues with people and circumstances that are hard to just give up or just hard to forgive and, and move on from it. Amen. 
But that's part of the problem, and it's part of what I want to talk to you about tonight. And that's what we're talking, dealing with here, is he said, there's a book. He said, I, there's some truth I want to give you. And it'll taste sweet, but there's some bitter consequences as well. And there's other things you have to deal with, amen, other than just the goodness of the whole thing, amen? So I'm, I, you don't have to go there, but just uh, I'm just going to flash back. Years ago, I preached a message <clears throat> of, about uh, a house of bread, and I, it was, I, it's kind of on my mind here. I'm not preaching it. I'm, I'm just referring to s some scriptures from there. But in the book of uh, Judges, the last chapter, the last verse of Judges, which is 2125, it says, and the people did what was right in their own mind. In other words, they had a, a tradition and religious way of doing things, and that's what they were doing, because there was no judge in the land. There wasn't anybody to give them direction, amen, spiritually speaking. And the very next verse, which is Ruth 1, says, and there was, in Bethlehem, there was a famine. Now that, in itself, is idiotic. I mean, it's, it's crazy because Bethlehem is the house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means, amen, house of bread. And it says there was a famine there. Okay, everybody's doing what they think they ought to be doing, amen, religiously, and there comes a famine. Amen. In other words, the bread of God is not being served the way it should, or they're not receiving it the way they should. And so Ruth and her husband and her two boys, they leave Bethlehem. They leave the house of bread and go into Moab, go to a place of idolatry and where God is not honored or blessed or anything else. And it says, all hell broke loose, to be quite frank. Amen. Her husband dies, her two sons marry, and then they die and leave her with two daughter-in-laws. Amen. And she's lost everything. So she decides to come home. She's got nothing else to do. She comes home. And of course, you know the story. The one daughter finally stays. Her daughter-in-law stays. But Ruth comes with her. And they come back to Israel. They come back to, to Bethlehem. And, it's, and they said, hey, it's, it's Naomi. It's, it's, it's Naomi. And she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, which means bitter. She was bitter. She said, we went out full. Now, that's a strange thing to say when she it said they left because there was a famine in the land. And she says, but we went out full, and I've come back empty. But she had something she didn't even know she had until she was away from it, yeah. until she got out. She came back, and she was bitter, but the thing that <laughs> saved her was a redeemer. And that redeemer gave her back everything, the land that she had lost, a family that she had lost. Amen? That Redeemer, the kinsman Redeemer, that Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ. It's a picture of Jesus and it's a picture of us leaving the truth of God, leaving what God really wants us for traditions, for better physical desires or whatever it might be, and then coming to the end of ourselves and realizing wow. we're bitter without a Redeemer. Mm -hmm. We need someone to save us. We need someone to be a mediator between us and God. Somebody to make things right again. Somebody to, to give us the things that God has promised us that we can't get on our own. Amen? So with that in mind, let's look at Revelation chapter 2. And I want to read verses 8 and 9. Now, I'll remind you, I said this is going to be kind of convoluted because it's kind of the way God has been speaking to me about it. And I hope that I can make some kind of sense out of it. But unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, look at this again and just kind of get it in your mind. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, one that was dead and is now alive. I know your works and your tribulation, and poverty, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, and they're not Jews, but they're actually of the synagogue of Satan. Okay? Now Luke chapter 17 and verse 1. And I'm going to be flip-flopping back and forth here, and it may not seem like I'm making any sense, but I hope to God I'm hearing from God, and I'm going to be able to share it in a way that It'll make sense to you. 
But this Luke chapter 17 is a picture of God and how we are to function in the earth. It's all about forgiveness. It's about or lack of forgiveness. And it's all about not just us. I've always read this as somebody done me wrong. So I'm aggravated, I'm frustrated, I'm bitter, and I just can't get over it, I can't get past it, I can't forgive them, I can't, you know, I just can't deal with it. So I carry this bitterness. But the truth is, it's God showing us how He deals with us, how we're to deal with one another, but also, and maybe most importantly, how we're supposed to deal with ourselves. We heard it. Ron said this morning, my past, it wants to come back. It wants to, oh, we all deal with that. The enemy wants to use something that we've done, something that, to make us feel like we're unworthy, that we have no right for God to do anything in our lives. You know, we become bitter with ourselves. Yes. Amen? So that's, that's where we're going here. But so in, in Luke 17, verse 1, he says, Then said he unto the disciples, It's impossible, but that offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. Now that word offenses, you've probably heard this all before, but I'm just going to say it again, is the word scandalon. Amen? To be offended. It's scandalous in your mind, okay? It's, it's emotional reaction to something. To be offended, right? It, it affects your flesh, in other words. It's what it, does. it makes you angry, it makes you upset, it, whatever. It, you're offended. And scandalous is a term that's used to describe trapping animals. The, the word, the Greek word that we translate as scandal on, or we use a scandal on, is actually that Greek idea of hunting or trapping animals. And it, mean, it literally means to entrap. So an offense has two categories. What someone did or said or what someone did not do or say. Right? In life, Jesus just tells us it just happens. It's the old cliche. Stuff happens. Right? Praise the Lord. It just happens. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We, we were scandalous. We, we, were, we were trapped in ourselves, in our own sins, in our own unforgiveness, in our own inability to forgive ourselves and all of this, and yet Jesus forgave us. Praise the Lord. So Luke 17 and 1, he says, Then said he unto the disciples, <coughs> excuse me, it's impossible, but that offenses will come. You can't live in this world without having stuff happen. Offenses will happen. But woe unto him to whom they come. Okay, verse 3. Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. All right, that word, take heed to yourself, that heed is literally means to get a grip on yourself. Yes. Okay, so when it's somebody else or when it's your own conscience or the enemy comes to you and tries to cause you to feel like, okay, nothing's gonna, nothing can happen, nothing good's going to happen, God can't use me, God can't do this, God can't do that because of this or because of the other or, or whatever, amen? So you're supposed to get a grip on yourself and not the offender. The focus is not the offender. The focus is the individual that's offended. Yeah. And he says, take heed to yourselves. In other words, get a grip on yourself. Amen? Put your emotions away. Take time to think about it before you respond, before you react. So when the enemy comes in like a flood, amen, we are to lift up the standard, which is the Word of God, what God says about us, regardless of what the enemy says, likewise for somebody else. He said... Take heed to yourselves if your brother trespasses. What's a trespass? That's going too far. It's crossing a line. It's crossing a, a line that says this is as far as you go, but you go beyond it. Or somebody goes beyond what you're comfortable with to you, and that's a trespass. That's, that's an offense. Amen? So somebody goes too far. And he says then to rebuke them. I've always thought my definition of rebuke is Shut the hell up. What do you, who do you think you are? And why are you talking to me this way? And blah, blah, whatever, you know, right? But the word is actually epitomio, and it means 
to fix an evaluation on. In other words, evaluate what was said. How accurate is it? Is it true? Where does it fall in reality? Instead of just being offended by it, you're supposed to fix an evaluation on it. And the other word is censure. You censure it. In other words, that's not right. I'm not going to. I'm not going to hear that. I'm not going to listen to that. Right? And then he says, rebuke him or censure the the, the thing, the offense, or evaluate it. You know, uh, fix an evaluation on it. And if he repents, forgive him. So when the thought comes to me that. I'm unworthy or that I'm not the righteousness of God. I need to evaluate where this is coming from. And then I need to, if necessary, I need to repent. In other words, I need to change my mind about what I'm hearing after I've evaluated the truth of that statement or that thought or whatever it is. Then I'm, I'm to, to repent. I'm to change my mind. I'm to not let that become the reality. Amen? And then you forgive. And that word forgive here is aphemi. And it means to let it go permanently. It doesn't mean I forgive, but I'm not getting over this. You know, I'll verbalize it, but I'm not going to get past that. It means to let it go permanently. Now, your flesh doesn't like it. It may not be satisfied. It want to bring it up again. Just like it would be with somebody else, you know, amen. But that's what Jesus taught in Luke 17, 3. Get a grip on yourself. If somebody, if you or somebody goes beyond the limit that has been established, evaluate that. Think about it. Judge, you know, censure it. And then forgive them. Let it go permanently. Verse 4. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. That's what Jesus does for us every single day, every hour of our day, for all of our eternity. He's not telling us to do something that he doesn't do. This is how God operates. This, therefore, is how we are to operate because we have... Christ in us, the hope of glory. We have to treat ourselves this way. And if we don't treat ourselves this way, I promise you, you won't treat others that way. Yeah. Angry people generally are angry with themselves first. Yeah. And the only way they can escape that self-hatred or self-anger is to get angry with somebody else, is to project it. Amen? And Jesus said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I have forgiven you. Your sins are as far as the east is from the west. They don't exist anymore as far as I'm concerned. Not the past, not the present, or not the future. They're, they're done. I've dealt with it. I'm, I've got a grip on myself, and I'm not going to let it bother me. It's okay between us. That's what we have to do with ourselves and with others. Amen? Verse 4, he says, Seven times in a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. In other words, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. Permanent. Verse 5. Here's where we all are. The disciples said, increase our faith. In other words, they said, are you kidding? I mean, maybe once. But seven times, over and over and over, and Jesus says, yes, this, this is how Christ operates. This is how God operates. And you are Christ in this earth. And if you want to be successful, this is how you are successful. We take these little stories like this, and we kind of just shove them off on a shelf and think, There's no, I mean, that's really not that important. But it's critical because God's trying to show us His nature, and therefore our nature. Without this, we're not ever able to totally forgive ourselves and therefore are always easily offended and want to hold something against somebody else. But God has wiped the slate clean. And he said, I'm asking you to 
be like me. We want to cast out demons. We want to raise the dead. We want to heal the sick. And he's given us the easy things first. If you can't do these, why do you think you'd be able to do the other, the greater? We think it's, well, I mean, it's not that big a deal. I'm going to cast out a devil. Well, you might. But he's telling us this is the nature. This is the reality that does that. This is the mystery of Christ in you. The hope of glory. It isn't just having a healing program somewhere. It's being Christ-like. So then he says, the apostles are going, come on, man. You're, 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 you're not serious about this. So if you are, I'm going to need a whole lot more faith than what I've got because what I'm thinking is nowhere near what you're thinking. So increase our faith is what they say. Well, now look what Jesus says. Verse 6. He said, if you had got faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you'd say to the sycamine tree, be plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the seed, it would obey you. He said, it doesn't take that much faith to deal with the fence. If you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you'd say to the sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the seed, and it should obey you. He calls the offense a sycamine tree. You see it? He said, if you had faith, the, he's dealing with the offense that they're talking about, of being offended over and over. He said, if you had faith, you'd say to the sycamine tree. So he's using the sycamine as a metaphor or as a type of the offense or the attack or whatever it is. Amen? Why a sycamine tree? I mean, why not an apple tree? Why not a peach tree? I'll tell you, because... I learned four things about sycamine trees. Number one, they're the preferred word, word, wood for building caskets in the Middle East. And the reason is because they don't require hardly any water. They grow everywhere because they don't need much water, so they can grow nearly in a desert. So, Jesus is saying, bitterness will bury you. Number two, a sycamine has a very deep root structure. So deep that if you cut it off at the ground, it'll just grow back. Now, I know a little bit about this because I've been cutting down trees at my place for 30 or for 20 years almost. And they keep wanting to come back. And unless you go and grind that root stump and get the root out of there, it'll start shooting up little, little trees. Amen? But that's the sycamine. It has a deep root structure, and if you cut it off, it'll grow back. You have to dig the root out. You have to go to the root, amen, to kill it. Praise the Lord. Number three, they look like a plum tree. And plums are really sweet. Problem is, only rich people in the Middle East could afford plums in Jesus' time when he's talking about it. They were really sweet fruit. But the sycamine is a bitter fruit. It, it has a fruit that looks like a plum, but it's really bitter. And so they would, the poor people would eat them. But you couldn't eat them all at once. Amen? you just take a bite, and it was so bitter, you had to put it down, go do some other things, and then you could come back a little later, take another bite, but you couldn't eat it all at once. You had to just eat it a little at a time because of the bitterness. Amen? Praise the Lord. So just like the sycamine tree, bitterness will keep you poor. It was the fruit of poor people. Remember Jesus said, I know, I, I, I know of your poverty, but you're rich. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, the sycamine is also... The fourth thing I want to tell you about is it's pollinated by the sting of a wasp. That's why Jesus said it's like a sycamine. It'll bury you. It has deep roots and is bitter as a sting from a wasp. Praise the Lord. 
All right, Luke 17, verse 6, And then the Lord said, If you had faith as a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So in other words, you've got to speak to it. Thinking about it won't change it. Am I making any sense at all this morning? I'm talking about me. I'm preaching to me this morning, but I'm telling you this is for everybody. It's for all of us. Amen? Your voice is your authority. Jesus said, I, I only say what my Father says. And if we could keep that, we'd be victorious over every situation. The trouble is we start saying stuff that God never said. In fact, we speak the opposite of what God said. Amen? Amen? He said, speak to it. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise the Lord. No matter what your mind tries to tell you, no matter what the devil tries to tell you, no matter what somebody else tries to tell you, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You need to pluck it up by the root so that you have permanent freedom. The way you do that is to speak to it. He said you would say to it. Amen? Praise the Lord. Permanent freedom. And he said, then what would happen, it, and speak to it, be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea. Why that? Because salt water is toxic to plants. Salt water will kill the tree. Permanent deliverance is what he's telling us. Not a continuous, ongoing struggle with it day in and day out, but permanent deliverance. It will obey you, he said. See, your emotions will try to rule you. Your flesh will try to manipulate you because that's the devil's access to you. That's how he gets to you is through the flesh. Amen? So, back to verse 3. Get a grip. Amen? Get a grip on yourself. And don't let the enemy determine your realities. Hebrews 12, verse 15 through 29. Hebrews 12, 15 through 29. Praise the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. He gave up the promise of God for something just temporary. Yeah. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected because he found no place of repentance. Remember we were talking about repentance? He didn't see himself as the inheritor of the promise. Right? Or he wouldn't have ever just given up. So there was no place for him to evaluate the value of it. The, to make a, an evaluation of it. Or to even censor his own stupidity the way he dealt with it. Though he sought it carefully with tears. He didn't know how to do it. But we are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire. Nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words. Which voice we heard, we were reading in chapter 10 of Revelation, we'll get to more of that in a moment, but the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it will be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But you are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. 
And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Praise the Lord. You either get shook or you remain. Praise the Lord. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not shaken. This isn't about me. It's not about one person. It's not about others that have talked about what they do or are not going to do and so on and so forth. This is about the Lord. And if we are established on Him, the rock, that house can't be shaken. It cannot be moved. Praise the Lord. So everything around me might be shaken, but I'm not shaken. Praise the Lord. I will remain. Wherefore, we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Grace. The gift of righteousness. Our true identity. Hallelujah. Luke 17, 6, if you'll go back there again. And the Lord said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, be thou plucked up by the root, be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. So you can either listen to yourself or you can talk to yourself. Amen? Speak to your flesh. Speak to your emotions and they will obey you. Stop listening to them and start talking to them. When they want to talk, you talk. When they want to speak to you, you speak to them. Praise the Lord. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 4. We are a nation of kings and priests, right? God has crowned us with authority, dominion, amen? And the Lord said, okay, Ecclesiastes, where the word of the king is, there's power. Praise the Lord. What you say means something. It's powerful. Praise God. Psalms 103, verses 1 through 5. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities. Who healeth all thy diseases. Who redeemeth thy life from destruction. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things. So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And the angel of the church at Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. The word Smyrna literally means bitterness or struggle. Actually, it means bitterness and suffering. And Jesus is going to speak to them about bitterness and poverty and suffering. And Jesus says to the Smyrnans, I want you to know that first of all, I have the power of resurrection. That's why he addresses them as the one who was dead but is now alive and forevermore. So the first thing he wants them to understand is I've got resurrection power. I have the power to give new life. Amen? Amen. Verse 9, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So again, the name means sufferings or bitterness. And he says, but thou art rich. People perish for lack of knowledge. If you believe your bank book more than you believe the word of God, you're stuck with your bank book. If you believe the lawyer, more than you believe what the Word of God says about the situation, you're stuck with the consequences of whatever that lawyer is saying. Every, everything operates this way. Because he says, you're rich. Even though you think you're poor. Jesus was rich and He became poor for our sakes. So that through His poverty we might be made rich. Praise the Lord. See, we've, we've got to where we play some games sometimes in Pentecost and charismatic 
circles. We talk about spiritual warfare. But spiritual warfare is simply maintaining the victory that Jesus won. The victory is ours. We enforce it. How do we enforce it? With our words, with our belief in what he has said. And I have people all the time saying, I don't know, I can't, this isn't happening, and that won't work for me. And don't tell me that. Because what you're telling me is you believe your situation more powerfully and more strongly than you believe the word of God. And I can't help you when you're there. Because all I can do is keep pointing you back to the word of God, which is the truth. But if you don't believe it's the truth, then... It's like talking to a wall. Victory over poverty. Victory over bitterness. Victory over sickness. Victory over bondage of any kind. Satan comes to challenge your victory in Christ. We think spiritual warfare is standing in the gap. Jesus already stood in the gap. He became the mediator between God and man. He, he became the, the man who stood in the gap and made up a hedge. And we think we're going to get in the gap and we're going to stop the demons and so on and so forth. Jesus already did it. We are to stand on who we are in Christ and what is ours in Christ. That is spiritual warfare. It's that simple. Psalms 105, verse 17 to 19. This is powerful. Look at this. This is spiritual warfare. I'm about to read to you. Psalms 105, verse 17 to 19. And it's talking about Joseph when he had been imprisoned for no reason, for nothing wrong. He hadn't done anything. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. Verse 19. Until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. God isn't trying you. The word is trying you. You're tried by the Word of God. Am I going to believe it or not? Joseph had a choice. He could believe what God told him, or he could have just thrown up his hands and said, this ain't right. I mean, I'm not supposed to be in jail. Everybody's supposed to be bowing to me, and, and it's not happening. And why am I being treated this way when I did nothing wrong? No, the Word was trying him. What God had said was trying to him to see whether or not he would believe what God said in spite of his circumstances. Church, I'm telling you, we are in a day where if we're not going to believe the Word of God, that word will try us. It'll put you in a position where you have to make a decision. I'm going to believe God. We heard it in the testimonies this morning. That's what we're talking about. It isn't God trying you. It's the word has already been settled in heaven. Now are we going to settle it here? Are we going to enforce the victory of Jesus Christ or for whatever the circumstance or the situation might be? Or are we going to let the word try us and fail? Praise God. The Word tried him, and he passed. Amen? Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9. That's why Satan immediately comes from the Word. God will give you a Word, a promise. You'll find it here. You'll see it. And immediately Satan comes from that Word. That Word's going to try you. To see whether or not you're going to believe Satan's five cents world. Or are you going to believe the world of the spirit. What God has said. The truth. I'm telling you that's what. I don't know about anybody else. But God's been dealing with me about this. And that's what I'm dealing with right here. You're going to believe what you're seeing. Or are you going to believe what I told you 30 years ago. Oh, I, I, surely it should have come to pass by now. He's not in time. Time means nothing to him. It only means something to us because we've got, we got our own agenda. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. According to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now, we know that all this is pointing to Jesus Christ. But we also know that ultimately we are the temple of God. So it's talking about us as well. So everything that this thing was being built was to tell us something about us and our relationship with God. Amen. All right. Exodus 25 and verse 22. I told you this was almost random, but 
And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. So he said, I'm going to meet with you and commune with you above the mercy seat, so in the holy of holies, the place behind the veil. That's where God wanted to meet with us. But as it was under the law, only the high priest could come once a year on the Day of Atonement. All right? Verse uh, 31. Still Exodus 25, verse 31. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold. Beaten work shall the candlestick be made. His shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs, and his flowers shall be of the same. It's the menorah, and it was in the holy place, not in the holy of holies. It was in the room just outside of the presence of God. In fact, the light is what gave light for the priests to minister within the holy place, right? All right, back to Revelation 2.10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. Remember the scandal on the trap, the entrapment, bitterness, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, not our death, but the death of Jesus. Be faithful unto his death, what he accomplished in that death, and I will give you a crown of life. So the church, and this is what I believe the Lord is telling me, the church is in transition. It's in transition from the candlestick to the most holy place. From the Feast of Pentecost to the Feast of Tabernacles. From a 60-fold to a 100-fold. It's people moving from one realm into a realm of a greater dimension of God's glory. It doesn't come without some shaking. It doesn't come without some challenges. It doesn't come without some opportunities to become bitter. Praise the Lord. All right, if you will back up to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Remember, we were talking about trumpets in, in chapter 10, too. But here's the point. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard a voice as of a trumpet behind him. Amen. Verses 12 and 13. Now remember, from the candlestick to the Holy of Holies, to the presence of God. I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about with the paps with a golden girdle, moving from the candles to the presence. Amen? To the light of the world. Not just light, not just some revelation, but the revelation, the person and, and reality of God himself. Amen? The feast of the trumpets, which is what this is representing, it follows Pentecost. It's what comes after the feast of Pentecost. Amen? The blowing of the trumpets represented, and you can get this from any Jewish his, history uh, uh, lesson, praise the Lord, it represented a prophetic voice releasing revelation. That's what the trumpets were representing. That's what they, it was like God speaking. That's why we see the angels talking and it's, they heard thunders and, and trumpets and so on and so forth. So it's the blowing of the trumpets represented a prophetic voice releasing revelation. And John heard a voice like a trumpet. Amen. The trumpet announced the great day of atonement where we have access into the presence of God, into the mercy seat. Amen? The message of atonement is what the Spirit is trying to communicate and has been trying to communicate for 2,000 years. In Revelation 2.10, if you go back there, Revelation 2.10 and 11... Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison. The scandal on again. That ye may be tried. That ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death. The death of Jesus. And I will give you a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the, says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Amen. The ten days of tribulation is significant. Because exactly ten days from the blowing of the trumpets is the day of atonement. 
a day of afflicting the soul. Only it's not our soul that was afflicted, it was Jesus. Praise the Lord. So when we grasp the atoning work of Christ, when we finally get the fact that it's finished, that He did it all, that we're perfect, there's nothing more that the enemy can do. All we have to do is enforce that reality to our own minds and to the others around us who are struggling with the same situations. Praise the Lord. Knowing that His suffering was enough, then our tribulation and suffering is over. It goes all the way back to Luke 17. It's, it's, it's all that he's talking about in all of this. I'm not nuts. I may be a little scatterbrained, but I mean, I, I'm seeing something here. God is speaking to me by the Spirit, and I'm saying, I'm just trying to say to you what he's been saying to me. Praise the Lord. The ten days are not literal. They just represent the transition of time that it takes to understand what Jesus' atonement produced. Praise the Lord. He did it all. And we're, we're wrestling with all kinds of stuff that is already settled. And then we go off to some spiritual warfare camp and, and, and jump around and act like idiots for... I'm not, I'm not trying to be, you know, sarcastic. And, but look, a lot of that is just... It's just flesh. The spiritual warfare is you demanding... Your position in Christ is you saying, I'm not backing off. This Word is what my reality is. I don't care what I'm looking at. I don't care what I'm dealing with here in the natural. This is the truth. And I'm not going to back off. And I'm not going to find myself bitter and whining and complaining because this and my life are not in agreement. Your responsibility is to make this your reality. I've got promises that were given to me 35 years ago. I haven't seen them. But by God, they came from the Lord. And by God, they will come to pass. Yes. If it's the last second and the last breath I take, before I leave this physical, natural world, I'm going to see them. Yes. Because God cannot lie. See, a lot of the church has been stuck in this 10-year time thing, this, this gap between the blowing of the revelation and the finished work of the atonement. We're still struck. We're still trying to get atoned for. We're still trying to become righteous. We're still trying to get stuff that's already ours. And until we have a grasp or understanding or a, a, a reality of what the atonement purchased, we're going to be in this limbo state, this religious kind of fog that causes us to do all kinds of strange stuff that are really not even biblical. But we feel like we've got to be doing something. Amen? See, it's, it's time to disciple our flesh. Amen? The way Jesus was trying to teach His disciples and exercise our riches in Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 Verses 24 through 28. I'm trying to hurry. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. That last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it manifests that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, that sounds kind of strange. I mean, kind of contradictory almost. But it's talking about the mystery of Christ and God being one and about us being in Christ. It's when this comes, it's when this revelation, and it comes as a result of understanding the atonement that has put us back in God and God in us. I know we talk about the Trinity, but I'm not, I'm not debating the Trinity. I'm just saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. 
He manifests in three... But He is one. Jesus is a man in heaven. Praise the Lord. All right, Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. This is the end time mystery. Everything's in Christ. To the angel of the church of Smyrna write these things, saith the first and the last. He's the first thing you'll see in heaven. He's the last thing you'll see in heaven. He's the only God you're going to see in heaven. He is God. Amen. He is all in all. He is everything. He is the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. The first and the last. The one that was dead but is alive forevermore. He was dead and is alive. So here's the option. You can either yield to the second death in Christ and not be hurt, or you can take the path of resistance and suffering and poverty and bitterness. Amen. But I want to see Christ first and last. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want I don't want to be I don't want to be confused, praise the Lord. I want to accept the fact that He's alive in resurrection power, able to redeem me from tribulation, from poverty, from every prison that the devil has cast us into, every snare, every scandal on. See, they don't just exist in relationships. They are entrenched in our minds. That's why our mind has to be renewed to the Word of God. Praise the Lord. These are bondages we're talking about. Bitterness allowed to creep in. I'm not talking about addictions here, and I, I mean, that's really not what I'm after. I, that's not my point. But these are bondages to traditions, to religion, to flesh, to our own IQ. I said before, I, I, you know, one of the biggest challenges is to, to, to repent from our own intellect. This, these are the bitternesses that are allowed to creep in, whether they're religious, traditions, ideas, concepts. They entrap us. But Jesus Christ is so much more. He's more powerful than anything. He's above all things. And we are seated with Him in heavenly places. He's come to redeem the church in Smyrna. Amen. These churches are us. I mean, I don't care how you want to, you can use whatever metaphor you want to, but I can see we are every one of these churches. I'm not saying they weren't separate churches that existed, but I'm saying they are the reality of what the church is today. Every one of them. We, we see, you can see yourselves in there. And that's the, that's the challenge. That's what he's trying to get us to understand. He's come to give us a revelation of himself. Amen. One that is able to lift us out of our suffering, out of our bitterness, out of our poverty, out of our prisons, to give us a crown of life and understand what's behind that veil. to step into the most holy place. An understanding of the true life of God, able to overcome and not be hurt by the second death, but have life and have it more abundantly. That is God life. That's what we have. That's who we are. We are the offspring of God. We are the children of God. We are the, the carriers of Christ in this earth. How can anything withstand that as, as long as we know if we know and understand what that atonement did no devil in hell will stand against you they'll run like a scalded dog like their hair's on fire if you know who you are they'll recognize you in a heartbeat and that's where God is getting us and taking us to that's what I mean by the the, the leaving the realm of the candlestick, which is revelation, but it's all confused. It doesn't seem to have, you know, a purpose to it other than just more information. He's moving us from there into the holy place, into the presence of God. And that's that scripture that he's talking about in Corinthians when he's talking about and all things ended up going back to God. 
<laughs> See, it could end today if we understood that. Christ in Him, us in Christ, we are one. That's all there is. But we're so fleshly focused that all we see in here are the individual people sitting here when Paul said, all I see is Christ. I just see one out here. That's what God's trying to get us to. There's no difference. There's no separation. There's no difference between Him and us anymore. It sounds almost blasphemous because, because it's a God thought. It's a, it's a God's way of looking at things. We have become one with Him. And what do we find in heaven when it's all said and done? What is the great discovery? What he's been telling us for the last 2,000 years? We're one. When this mystery ends, the, the revelation will be simply that Christ is in God and we are in Christ. All things come back to where they started. God. In the beginning, God. In the end, God. We were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are in Christ. After the fall, there was a separation. But He came and redeemed us from the bitterness, from the suffering, from all that we should have had to go through so that we would have a revelation of Jesus Christ. Not a picture of Him on a cross. Not some physical dimensions that we could see and see what color His hair is or His eyes are or how tall He was or how much He weighed. No! To see us in Him. To see that there is just one thing when this is all said and done. You say, well, are we just all going to be crammed back into this? No, we're going to be as individual. Amen. But we are one with Him. That's the difference. Physically, we're going to get a glorified body. But we will know all things. What are we going to know? We're going to know what God knows. We're not going to be sitting in some classroom for a millennium to learn this stuff, we will know as we are known. And to, to have, to have the, the seal of this already and not live it, it's the greatest shame and, and the greatest waste that there is. And I'm telling you, the only thing between us and the return of Jesus is this revelation. This becoming a reality in us. Amen. He will appear in you, and you, and you, and you, and me. Amen. And we'll be caught up in that, not in the atmosphere, but in the Spirit. And there shall we ever be with the Lord. This is the challenge. This is spiritual warfare, church. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I'm, I'm through with all the other stuff. This is my warfare. This is my battle. To every time the enemy comes, every time a situation comes, every time a circumstance comes, every time a doctor's report comes, every time a banker's report comes, this is who I am. This is my reality. And I'm going to believe it that they drag me kicking and screaming to a nut house. It'll still be the reality because it will not change. And until we conform to it, we're just rocking on another generation until Jesus shows up. Praise the Lord. I'm not bitter. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I'm better. Praise God. And we are, church. I'm not mad. I'm mad at the devil. I'm tired of the, of the sparring and the and the just little wrestling games. And so, I mean, I want to knock out punch here, and we've been given it to put him down and for good. And it's right here. It's the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. You cannot come against it. You cannot stand against it if we will maintain our stance, if we will continue the warfare. Hey, cowards run, man. I'm telling you. You can be afraid. That doesn't make you a coward. What makes you a coward is to give in to the fear. Everybody gets afraid. Everybody has fears. Everybody has issues with, how am I going to take care of this? How am I going to make that happen? There's nothing wrong with being afraid. You just don't give in to the fear. You fight the fear. And how do you fight it? With faith, with the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand this morning.
Amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for your patience. Go in the power of His might. That's you. That's your identity. Amen. And don't let anybody try to take it from you. Praise God. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.